Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to open to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 10. Hopefully, I'll be able to finish up this chapter today. Well, that's the plan anyway. <clears throat> so you have your copy of God's Word your, in your 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to ask you to join me standing out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible Word. <laughs> We're going to begin in verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. While continuing their punishment, in verse 10, this is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. Father, would you help us to see what you want us to see, Lord? More importantly, Father, help us to understand and give us hearts to receive your truth. And give us a desire, Lord, to carry out what we know to be true. Father, we give you this time. We ask you to have your way. We ask your spirit to move about this place and convict the hearts of each and every one that's here. Lord, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you're just joining us, it was in, uh, I told you, First Peter we talked about First Peter. Peter, First Peter, when Peter wrote the letter, First Peter, he wrote it to the churches, telling them to hang in there because persecution was coming outside the church. Persecution was coming; it was going to cause uh, some serious problems to the average Christian. I explained to you that when we use the words, the words our English language has been watered down as we use the word love. I love pizza. I love my wife, and I love the Chicago Bears. We use words; we throw them out there. When we use the word persecuted, we say, "Oh, I've been, I'm being persecuted at work." And we have really have no idea what persecution looks like. None. We think we do because life is not easy because it's a little harder today than it was yesterday. So that's not persecution. I explained to you that these Christians were losing their lives. Their families were being tackled and shackled. You're sitting in the house. The door's coming off the, you know, the, getting on out off the hinges, but it's coming down. And they're coming in there and they're snatching people up, taking them to jail. They're killing them. They're burning them at the stake. They're feeding them to animals. They're tarring them. And it's just crazy what's, what's going on. That's the kind of persecution they're, they're experiencing from being Christians, just for being a Christian. And we in America, we can come and we can sit in our church today, and we have no fear, not really, of somebody coming through those doors trying to shoot the place up. If we do, if we do have that fear, it's some deranged lunatic that we're worried about coming through the doors, not the government, not the local authorities, not the federal authorities. We're not worried about that. And that's what they were worried about. Second Peter was different. The letter of 2 Peter, uh, 1 Peter, Peter was reminding them to hang in there because it's worth it. When it's all said and done, we're going to stand in the presence of God, and we're, it's going to have been worth it. Chapter, uh, 2 Peter was a, a letter by the uh, Apostle Peter. It's only got three chapters, and it was to the church about the problem inside the church. Right. He said, now when the persecution is coming, it's also inside the church. You're going to have infiltrators. You're going to have, uh, when I was in the army, I never forget, the word infiltrate. It's, it's a pretty powerful word. Infiltrate means somebody got behind your fortified position. When I was in the Army, we had a, we, 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 they had us, uh, we're doing a, we're on a, on a, on a maneuver in the woods. We're, uh, we're practicing uh, for war. And so we set up this perimeter. We got this, the guys, are, you know, all of us are laid out. And we're laid out on the ground. I was going to lay down for you and show you. But you're laid out and you got your rifle and you're waiting on an enemy that's not coming. You're practicing. Kind of looks like this. I'm going to lay down. You're like this. And you got your rifle out, and, you, and you're laying the ground because you don't want the enemy to see you. Got your heels down. You're all sprawled out nice and easy on the ground so they don't see you. Now, if there's 200 of us, and we're all laid like this, we're waiting on an enemy to come. But you're spread out. You're spread out like that. And as you're fanned out across a large area, your job is important. You have to watch for an enemy to make sure he doesn't sneak through your line 
Because once he gets on the other side, he can shoot your guys from behind. Or he can get you capture your command post or whatever the case may be. <laughs> well, you got to remember, I'm like 18 years old. I'm in the Army. And it's out there. You're just you're tired. They're, they're just running you ragged. And I'm laying out there. And you're laying out there for hours, waiting. The enemy's got the element of surprise. He's going to sneak up on you. He's going to get you. He's just taking his time. And eventually, Jose falls asleep. I'm sure you did. I know I'm not the only. I'm just telling on myself. Well, thank, hey, thanks for uh, standing with me, brother. I fell asleep. And the other guys, they, they, we wear miles gear, so you shoot them and they'll ring. You, so you know you shot them. They got this laser tag. And so anyway, the guy sneaks up on me on the other side. He's one of the range cadre. And he steps on my helmet. <laughs> he steps on my helmet and smashes my hand to my, my helmet, to my hand, to my, my rifle. And I'm like, ow. <laughs> he looks down at me. He goes, you're dead. So I go to stand up. He's laying down, man. You're dead. And so, I mean, come on. He said, you're dead. And then he made them pick me up and carry me. It was me and a whole bunch of other dudes that fell asleep. <laughs> when somebody infiltrates beyond, when they penetrate your circle, you got problems. You got problems. And what happens is, in the Army, like even when, when we, you're gonna, we're going to assault the enemy from this way, like in the, in the Persian Gulf, we had all these Marines come up. They, they came up on the Persian Gulf side during the first Iraqi war. And the Iraq, the Saddam Hussein's troops thought that the Marines were going to do an amphibious landing, an amphibious assault. So they sent all their guys to the side this way. We're going to assault the, the we're not going to let them take this beach. So they put all the resources this way. And I was in Germany at the time, and we had a, a tanker company called Seventh Corps. Seventh Corps tankers for out of Stuttgart, Germany, flanked them from the backside. They got around the back, and they came from behind, and they, it, was, it was a slaughter. It was a brilliant plan. Basically, the Marines were head faking, punk faking, got all their attention. Boom, all these bombs and stuff going up, and they're protecting, and they didn't watch their backside. We were able to sneak in behind them. Boom. It was beautiful. In, in warfare, that's a beautiful thing when you can penetrate the enemy's lines, get behind them. What's my point? My point is 2 Peter. Peter's telling the church. The enemy is going to infiltrate your church. He's going to slip in behind you. He's going to sit in the pew next to you. He's going to go to your Bible studies. He's going to go to your home groups. He's going to go to Sunday school. Watch it. That's what he's telling them. So you don't get your helmet stepped on. Don't fall asleep. The average Christian sleeps. And we watched the video a couple weeks ago. I showed you the lion prowling. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the enemy is like a roaring lion. And he wants to chew you up and spit you out. He can't stand you. He hits your guts. Right. And we're sleeping. <clears throat> Second Peter was written to the church, reminding them that, hey, that the problem is going to come inside the church. And part of your problem is going to come from behind this pulpit. From false teachers teaching you stuff that's not true. We talked about apostolic succession. I said they're the only people they, they knew. They didn't have a Bible like we had. The criteria for what was being taught had to come from an apostle or an apostle's associate. It had to be handed down. Things were creeping up, popping up, all kinds of heresies. Things that are, the word heresy means not biblical. It's in contrast to what the Bible teaches, but there was no Bible, so how are you supposed to know? See, that church had a problem. The Bible was actually canonized for this purpose. So that we can know heresy when you see it. Amen. Yet the average Christian doesn't know it when they see it because they don't take the time to read their Bible. Second, Peter was a warning to those Christians. Watch out for those teachers. We talked about God. I said, don't worry, though, because those, those, those false teachers are going to be judged. God's going to take care of them for their wickedness. He's not going to stand for it. But in the meantime, he's, they're, they're, they're causing damage. What do we know about Satan? Is he victorious? Absolutely not. Ultimately, Satan is defeated. Amen? Amen? We know that Satan, at the end, when it's all said and done, he loses. The problem is, you heard the old story, you heard the, the, the verbiage, win the battles but lose the war? Or you could lose the battles and win the war? You heard that? Satan is winning battles, winning battles all day, every day. He's ultimately going to lose the war, which makes us victorious. But we're getting our teeth kicked in along the way. We're losing battles. 
God has said, remember in 1 Peter that we said that the Bible says that he has given us, God has given us everything we need for a life of godliness. Amen. Amen? Amen. We just talked about this a few weeks ago. Amen. The Lord has given us everything we need to be victorious. But we choose not to use it and we wonder why we're getting our teeth kicked in. The enemy is having a field day with us because we don't take him seriously. So 1 Peter, or 2 Peter says, chapter 2, he says, look, God's going to take care of these false teachers. Don't worry about it. Just like he didn't spare the angels, just like he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? All right. So we, that's where we're at. I'm bringing you up to where we stopped last week. God is good. Amen? Amen. So in verse 7, look what it be, verse 7, he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for the righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds of the, what he saw and heard. So Lot living in a filthy place like Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Bible says he was being tormented in his righteous soul. As you examine the book of Genesis and you read the life of Lot, you'd be hard-pressed to find that he was a righteous man. The only reason why I can tell you that he's righteous is because the scripture says so. And I know many Christians today who live a life just like Lot. They are righteous because God has redeemed them and bought them back by the blood of Jesus Christ, yet continue to choose, choose being the key word here, to live in filth, in muck and mire. They're no different. The difference is Lot was righteous. Many Christians might think they are, and they're not. For the Bible testifies with your spirit. The spirit of God testifies with your spirit that you're a child of God. It is not my place to say you're lost, that you don't know God. That's not my place. If a person professes faith in Jesus Christ and they tell me, I have a relationship with the living God, it is not me to say that they don't. Now, I can examine their lifestyle and tell you, you know what? Your lifestyle is inconsistent with what you say, but ultimately God is the judge. So you have to be very careful when you start saying this person is saved and that person is not. You can only go off their profession of faith. Bible, the lot is a clear example of a saved human being living an ungodly lifestyle. And the Bible says that God rescued him from that and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah in the process. So we picked up in verse 9, he says, if this is so, and it is, because the scripture says so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and hold the unrighteous, those who are ungodly, for the day of judgment. Well, at the same time, continuing their punishment. This is especially true for those who follow corrupt, follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, these men are not afraid to, to slander celestial beings. That's uh, verse 10. I'm reading out of the NIV. Somebody have a different translation? Want to read it? says he is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire and who despise authority. What, NLT? Yes. Who else? Anyone else? It says especially those who follow the polluting desires of the flesh and despise authority. Anybody have King James? <laughs> what does it say? But chiefly them walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise the government. Walk after lust. You ever said sexual desires? Twisted sexual desires. Twisted sexual desires. You know what that means? That means that sexual desires in itself is not a bad thing. God has given us that. And in the context of a marriage, as defined by God in Scripture, there is nothing wrong with sexual desires. For the Bible says that. It teaches that over and over. There's nothing wrong. But her translation said twisted sexual desires. Twisted, how so? Twisted from, different from what the scripture teaches. The, the scripture teaches a husband has a wife and a wife has a husband and there's to satisfy each other's sexual desires. And there's nothing shameful of that. Nothing. The scripture teaches that. Outside of that, it is twisted. Right. Satan twists it and he turns it. And when people pursue that, and that's why I went to the other translations, it was sexual desires that was driving these false teachers. I shared an example with you of what this looks like in today's context as I saw it with before my very eyes in this church from a so-called man of God. 
This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desires of the sinful nature, the lust, pursuing those sexual desires, those twisted sexual desires. Within a marriage, green light. If you're in a marriage and you stray outside the marriage, you're an adulterer, the red light. If you're not married, red light, fornicator. Bold and arrogant, these men men are not afraid to slander celestial beings. Yet even angels, who are stronger and more powerful than, than them, than mere men, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. What are we talking about here? These false teachers, not only were they pursuing their, uh, their sinful, lustful passions, they were slandering the spiritual realm. I have a, the Bible says God will not be mocked. As a man reapeth, so shall he soweth. I know people don't believe in God. They say, hey, you don't exist. He's made up. He was conjured up to control people. And I say, you better watch your mouth. For you to mock God, to make fun of God, and think that he's limited by some form or fashion. You're, you're treading on, you're, you're, you're skating on thin ice. These teachers were teaching something that they do not know and understand. Remember something, I got to share this with you. Somebody asked me once upon a time, they had a family member who committed suicide. And they told me, you know, I heard that if you commit suicide, you go straight to hell. I said, you know what, show me the biblical support for that. Well, that's what I was told. I don't care what you was told. Show me your biblical support. Chapter, book, chapter, and verse. And I'll tell you, you're not going to find it. So you don't go to hell? Show me your biblical support for that. That's all I could tell you. The Bible doesn't say that. Oh, spare the rod, spoil the child. You ever heard that one? The Bible don't say that either. Okay, you need to know what the Bible says. The person asked me this because a person in their family had committed suicide and they were worried about their eternal, their eternal, their eternity. I said, Jesus said, the only, Jesus said, he said, all sins are forgivable in this life and the life to come. He says, the only life, the only sin that is unforgivable is to, this is Jesus' words, the only sin that is unforgivable, he says what? The only sin that is unforgivable is to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to mock the Spirit, to attribute the Spirit's power to something else, and say, you know what, that's not really the Spirit of God. Uh, They said it when they they told Jesus that he was using the powers of of Satan to to cast out demons. That's blasphemy. And you better watch it because you're blaspheming the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, oh... He said the kingdom not divided when I stand. He went in and explained all of that. The point is, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is the only sin that's unforgivable. And here, Jesus is saying, these guys are, right, they're tre- I mean, Peter's saying, these guys are treading on blasphemy, right on the threshold of blasphemy. They're making fun of angels. They are, uh, they're things that they don't understand. These so-called teachers, they're teaching things that are not biblical. Yet, he says, that, you know, they're, that's one thing. And another thing is this, to, uh, I, I've met a lot of Christians that tell me, I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm like, you better watch your mouth. You better watch your mouth. I ain't afraid of him. I'm, you, I'm not saying walk in coward and fear because the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So we walk in confidence. We walk in the power and the spirit of God. And we walk in the authority of Jesus' name. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm saying is don't mock Satan. Don't, I'm telling you, don't talk smack. You get your mouth slapped. I'm telling you. Can God protect you? Absolutely. Satan is God's devil. What I'm telling you is most Christians ain't prepared to deal with that devil when they're talking that crazy stuff. I shared a story with you about my favorite cartoon growing up, Tom and Jerry. Tom, Spike, the bulldog was on a leash. All right, that bulldog was a bad mamma jamma. All right, Tom was wreaking havoc. 
chasing Jerry around, doing his thing. Jay, Jerry's just agitating him, just trying to get him mad. So what happens is J Jerry runs towards Spike. And just before Tom can get him, Spike comes in rah, 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 and almost chews Tom up. Tom runs away from him like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then Tom realizes after a couple of times, a couple of tries, he realizes that Spike can only come this far because that's where his leash is at. So Tom draws a line in the sand. He says, as long as I stay on this side, Spike can't get me. Here's your analogy, folks. Spike is the devil. He's God's devil on a leash. God gives him a leash. He's got room to reign, but it's God's leash. God pulls it in. God lets it out. But Tom draws a line. And instead of staying the heck away from that line, Christian, he comes right up to it and taunts Spike. La, la, la. And Spike comes. And Tom's laughing at him. <laughs> Taunting him. Well, Spike's not stupid. He erases the line. And he draws it a little closer. He eats his lunch. Spike gets old of Tom. He gets old of him. <laughs> and I'm laughing because, you know, Tom's the villain, right? We want to see him get beat up, so we're happy. But that's Satan, and Tom is the Christian. Right. Instead of staying away from that line, we'll come up and talk, and we'll be, I ain't scared of the devil. I ain't scared of the devil. God's got him on the leash, but you're all over the line. You're all over the line. These teachers were teaching things that, things that they don't understand. They're teaching things they do not understand. He says, even the angels, who are stronger than these so-called teachers, do not bring slanderous accusations against such beings in the presence of the Lord. They know better. The angels know better than to talk crazy about Satan. And these false teachers are doing it. Woe to them. Verse 12. So there's your first, there, there's your first lesson. Look, you see a guy who's talking stuff, you know, he's, don't slander celestial beings. That's a good idea. Those men blaspheme in matters they do not understand. That's what I just covered. They are like brute beast creatures of instinct, born only to be caught and destroyed. Like beasts, they will perish too. Brute beast, creatures of instinct, anyone, translation, I'm looking for synonyms. Anyone? Frank? It says, but, but these people like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, speak, yep. speak blasphemous, blasphemes about things they don't understand. Look, irrational. irrational. That's what irrational. you say, what, that's, uh, what, tra oh, what translation? You got the King James, Claudia? Yeah. What's it say? Verse 12. That's verse 12. It says these natural brute beasts. Yeah, it says, be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Speak evil. I think the uh, KJV, also uh, the parallel translation, uh, said vile, saying vile things. Uh, you're, you're vilifying. To vilify. Okay, this is what I want you to see. These, they're like natural brute beasts. You said creatures of instinct. Irrational animals. Have you ever, um, <laughs> when I became a police officer, I thought you could reason with everybody. I really did. And I'm a guy who likes to talk, and the first call I come on, I think, you know what? I got eight hours to handle this call. And if it takes ten, I get paid overtime. I'm not in any hurry. I don't force things. I, 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 use, I believe diplomacy always prevails. Force is a last resort which I have no problems using, but I try to use it last because it really doesn't solve the problems. It's just a means to an end. So I really try to help people solve their problems. <laughs> and as I realized on the police department, I was very successful speaking with people, rationalizing with people, getting them to understand, getting them to see. And what I realized is some people, you could talk to them until you're blue in the face. The lights are on, nobody's home. And they're just waiting for an opportunity to, to, to attack you or somebody else. That's the irrational animals, these creatures of instinct. You can't talk to them. 
they're going to do what they do. Dogs, bark. Cats, meow. You can't get a cat to bark. Their instinct is to meow. And these guys, their, their instinct is to get all they can, to use religion as a means to benefit themselves. These Christians didn't have the Bible to measure the things they were saying against. So Peter's telling them, look, pay attention to their life. This ir irrational animals, these creatures of instinct, you have... I'm looking for kids, just in, other than him. You ever seen a dog? And he... Yeah. Any of you? Yes? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you ever seen the male dog when the female's in heat? Mm -hmm. Nobody's got to tell them anything. Nope. Instinctively, they're sniffing. They're looking. They'll wander. They'll find. And they'll... Yeah. That's what they do. Nobody's got to tell them that. They don't need a class. <laughs> the vet doesn't have to show them. <laughs> it's instinct. And these teachers were chasing after this human passion, this desire, this lust that we're talking about in the same manner that a dog does. Amen? That's what's happening here. Peter's like, pay attention. Is that consistent? Look, what you see, is that consistent with the God we know we, we serve and we love and serve? It's not. They speak blasphemy about things they don't understand, and in their destruction, they too will be destroyed. Verse 13. I'm holding this mic like I'm talking into it. It's this one. <laughs> they will be paid back with harm for the harm that they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse. Trina, synonym. Pastor Frank. Um, what's that, 13? Verse 12. Oh, no, it's verse 13. 13. Suffering, from <clears throat> suffering harm as, as the payment for unrighteousness, they consider it a pleasure to carouse, that same word, to carouse in the, in the daytime. daytime. Anyone got something other than carouse? Indulge. What would you say? Right. That's what you have, right? Indulge. Revel. Revel. Delight. You see the synonyms here? You see the picture that's being painted? They shall receive the reward for unrighteousness as they uh, uh, count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Go back to the NIV for me, James. They will be paid back for the harm that they have done. Who are we talking about? These teachers. These false teachers. See, there's a problem here. I know this may sound harsh, but they're leading people astray. They're causing major problems in the church that is more than just Peter's telling them, wake up, pay attention. See, as your pastor, I have a responsibility to protect the unity of the flock that God has given to me as your lead pastor. I have a responsibility to protect you from this. If I'm the culprit, if I'm the problem... Woe to me. God help me. Because this passage says, it's coming, Jose. If this was me, I can promise you that is not me. They will be paid back with harm for the harm that they have done. They're leading people astray. There's your, I'm not talking about a person who's struggling with their own desires, their sinful desires. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm tormented. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about you teaching somebody else that that's okay. Because it's not. I can never stand before you and tell you something's okay that the Bible clearly teaches is not. But they had no Bible, remember, in context. They are blots, blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. Peter's talking about the uh, Lord's suppers. At that time, the Christians came together. They called them a love feast. They'd come together and they would have fellowship dinners. They would eat together. Remember, some of these Christians didn't have. Because when they come to the Lord, they were actually casted out of their own families. They were alienated from their own families. So many Christians came together and they did these fellowship meals to eat together. The Apostle Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians because uh, it was being abused. What's happening here is he's, the, the, the Lord's Supper, as they participate in the Lord's Supper, which we will on uh, Palm Sunday. My plan, we're going to participate in the Lord's Supper the Sunday before Easter. Um, while they're doing that, I tell you when we're going through, this is a very solemn moment. As we reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you and for me. Amen. And the Bible says that you do not partake in an unworthy manner. You bring judgment upon yourself. 
And these guys, knowing, knowing that they were up to no good, knowing that they're taking advantage of the situation, trying to make their wallets fat, pursuing their lustful pleasures, had the gall to sit in the midst of these feasts that are sacred and are designed to promote unity and love. Peter says, they'll be paid back with harm for the harm that they have done leading others astray. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. Even societal norms, whatever normal was at that time, what's normally done, when a person is outside of the societal norms, they're typically hiding, doing what they're doing. Great example, weed, marijuana. There was a time where that stigma was a big deal. People were hiding in the alley, smoking, passing it, spraying cologne, trying not to smell like it. Breath mints. Because society said, that is a bad drug. Well, the world's changing. It's legal in some states. People are like, so this, this picture here, the idea of carousing in broad daylight is to do what society says is not OK in broad daylight, because you don't care. You could care less. That's what they were doing. Peter's like, hello, pay attention. They're carousing in broad daylight. They're blots, blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. They're, they're pursuing what they're doing, what they want. I heard uh, th these, these teachers were teaching that, hey, they're, pro uh, they're promising freedom. Jesus Christ frees you from the yoke of slavery, the, the yoke of sin. And so you can pretty much do whatever you want. Freedom doesn't mean you're free to do whatever you want to do. Freedom means you're free to do what you're supposed to do. That's what freedom means. And what happens is they're teaching them, hey, you're free. You can do what you want. It's all good. This is a problem because it's also taught today in churches. Christians say, hey, you know, I've been forgiven. Have you? Because that's a pretty crummy attitude from somebody who has been forgiven of so much. They're chasing after their own pleasures. Because it's all good. Go to verse 14 for me. Here's what I know. When Jesus breaks the sin, or breaks the, uh, the chains of, of sin, there's a time in your life where you don't know any better. You're ignorant. And the sinful desires of the world are just pulling. The natural desires, the natural instinct in you are just What's you pursuing? You have no idea. But the Bible says that God has called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. You have been enlightened. And as you've been enlightened, now you know better. Now to completely disregard what you know to be true, what you know to be right, is different. You see, there's one thing to... That we say in the police department, ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you're speeding and I pull you over, I say, hey, the speed limit is 25. You say, well, it's not posted. Doesn't matter. I didn't know. Doesn't matter. Doesn't change the fact that you're speeding. But it's how am I supposed to know? Doesn't matter. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Okay, but in God's case, the ignorance of the law, there is an excuse. God says, you don't know. So God says, look, I gave you the law to show you sin. Now, when you know and understand this is the law, this is sin, and I'm going to do this anyway, that is transgression. There's a big difference. Big difference. So what I do know is that when you're, at the time before you're enlightened, you don't know any better. You're like the speeder with the non-posted speed limit. You don't know any better. When you do know better, and you say, I still want to speed, the Bible teaches you're going to, if you don't submit yourself to God's ways, you're going to submit yourself to your sinful ways. Something. Something's going to master you. Something is going to lead you. Yep. Do you succumb to the ways of God, to the things of God, to what the Bible teaches, or do you succumb to your own evil pleasures, passions? Something will master you. If you do not submit yourself to God Almighty, you will submit yourself to something else. We call those idols. So verse 14 says, with eyes full of adultery. See, he's still, he's still on the, the passions, the lust. With eyes full of adultery, they can't stop sinning. They just can't help it. We get calls to house and people got barking dogs. Three o'clock in the morning. 
I'll get a call to a house and the lady goes, could you tell that dog to shut up? They're hanging out the window, shut up. The dog just keeps barking, shut that dog up. The dog just keeps barking, they can't get no sleep. And I go over to the house next door, I knock on the door and the neighbor wakes up. I'm like, you gotta, you gotta shut that dog up. How uh, do you suppose I do that? I'm like, I don't know. Bring him in the house. I don't know how you keep a dog from barking. I don't know. You Muslim, they can still bark. The dog can't stop barking. That's what dogs do. And he wants to keep barking. He's talking about the eyes full of adultery. They just can't stop it. They just keep pursuing it. They're seduced, unstable, the unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. These are the teachers he's talking about. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But there's Christians that are falling into this. Many of you are probably sitting here today like, hey, Pastor, I'm glad. Hey, that ain't me. I'm not a teacher, so I'm good, right? You need to watch for these guys. They're a heck of a lot more subtle. Peter is not, um, he's not condemning them, per se. He's exposing them. He's, this is descriptive. He's describing them to you. We know the story of Little Red Riding Hood and the big bad wolf, right? My, 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 grandma, what big eyes you have. Well, the better to see you with. My, my, grandma, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with. Until that wolf was exposed, Little Red Riding Hood was walking right into his grips. Peter's saying, hey, those are wolf ears. Those are wolf eyes. That is a wolf snout. And those are wolf's teeth. Peter's exposing these false teachers. So you have something, to, to a lens to look through. Verse 15. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the ways of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. This is a really cool story. If you don't know the story, it's in the Old Testament. Balaam was a prophet, and uh, he, was, he was a wicked man. He was, he was, he was motivated by money, by greed. Balaam, verse 15, they left the straight way. Remember I told you that Christianity is referred to as the way? Yeah. Capital W. They left the straight way and wandered off to follow the ways of Balaam. They left the straight way. You know what that means? That means that they've been enlightened. To leave the path means you had to have been on it. So these false teachers... Were enlightened at one point. They were enlightened. They had to come out of this, this, this ignorance, the darkness. They know better. They were ignorant. They didn't know any better. They stepped into light. They were enlightened by the teachings of the Lord. They were given wisdom and understanding. And they stepped over here to follow and pursue their own wicked ways. You know what they said? And I, I presume they were like, hmm. This can work for me. This can work for me. This is where the people have told me, hey, pastor, uh, religion was created by the federal government to control the masses. That's a lie. It was not created by the federal government. The federal government was trying to stop it. They were trying to snuff that fire out, that Christianity was spreading. They were trying to stop it. Kings, emperors, Nero set Rome on fire. They were burning Bibles, killing Christians, trying to deter the proliferation of the gospel. They didn't create it. They were here. They went, hmm, this can work for us. We could get rich doing this stuff. Make people give their money. Tell them we're going to damn them to, to hell if they don't uh, give more money. We can spook them. We can control them. That's these guys when they stepped over here. They've been enlightened. They come out of darkness. They've been enlightened. And the Bible says they have left the straight way. They've left the straight way and wandered off to follow the ways of Balaam. Balaam loved wages of wickedness. It's a great story. Go to uh, verse 16. Balaam, uh, <laughs> he got rebuked by a donkey. The donkey talked to him. He was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech, who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. 
<laughs> you got to read this story. It's a great story. He uh, basically, Balaam slaps his donkey. Just, yeah. just smacks him a couple of times, and the donkey's like, hey, dude, what's your problem? <laughs> and he's like, oh, my gosh. The Lord spoke to Balaam through a donkey. That's how I'm certain he can speak through me. Amen. If he can speak through a donkey, he can talk through burning bushes. I'm confident that the Lord can speak through me. I'm absolutely certain. So Balaam basically was being rebuked by his donkey because he's pursuing dishonest gain. Go to the next 16, verse 17. These, he's still talking about these, bad, these evil teachers. These men are springs without water and mist, mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them. These men are springs without water. Could you imagine? I used to watch the car. I loved cartoons when I was a kid. And you see them always out in the desert. And they're like, they see the water, they see the oasis, and they run up there and they find out it's only a mirage. And they're dying of thirst. You ever seen those cartoons? It's hilarious. That's what he's talking about. They're promising water but they have none to give. These prophets, these so-called teachers, they're promising you water, and they have none to give. These teachers promise freedom, yet freedom to do whatever you want, yet you're being enslaved by the very passions that you have. You're not free. There's a song we used to sing. It's an old hymn. It says, would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's power. There's wonderful power in the blood. Uh, would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Sin stains are washed in this life-giving flow. There's power. There's wonder work and power in the blood. Would you be free from your passion and pride? If you're not willing to be freed from that, the only thing that can free you from that is Jesus Christ. There's power in the blood. If you're not willing to be free from your passion and pride, you will be enslaved by it. At the root of every sin is pride. Verse 18. For the mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. Man. Okay. For the mouth empty. Basically, they're just blowing hot air. They just blah, blah, blah. They're talking loud and saying nothing. These teachers. Again, they had no Bible to compare it to. You do. Boastful words. They're appealing to the lustful desires of the sinful human being. I've told you this. If, if, if something in your Christian walk comes easy, you're probably doing it wrong. Unless God has given it to you as a gift, you're probably doing it wrong. The Bible says, Jesus says, that if any man wants to come after me, he must... Then I himself, and take, up take, up take, up cross, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny himself is the first thing he says, because what we naturally want to do, we shouldn't be doing. When somebody makes you mad, and you're driving down the street, and you want to pull up at the stoplight and give them a knuckle sandwich, that is the natural thing you want to do. I would strongly suggest you not do that. But that's what's naturally going through your mind. That's what's going through your heart, especially if you're bigger than he is. So that person pulls out a gun and shoots you full of holes, I'm telling you, it's not a good plan, but that's the first thought that goes through your mind. To deny yourself means, you know what, I want to punch this dude in the head because he made me so mad, but that doesn't honor God. That should be the second thought that goes through your mind. I don't want to do it. I want to deny myself. Well, he makes me feel like a fool for my wife and kids. Take up your cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Humble yourself. Nail that pride to that cross. And follow Jesus. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus punch that guy in the head? He wouldn't. He'd probably pray for him. Their mouth's empty, boastful words, and they're appealing to your lust. You ever hear somebody tell you, go ahead, do it. Go ahead. Jesus loves you. He'll forgive you. Though that may be true, Jesus will forgive. That is bad advice. That's bad doctrine. If they're teaching you that it's okay, it's all under the blood. Sinful human nature. They're appealing to your sinful human nature. The Bible says in the latter days, people would not settle for sound doctrine. They'd rather hear of the tickling of their ears. Tell me something good, pastor. Tell me something good. 
Tell me how much God loves me. Tell me how much he forgives me. Tell me about this place we have in heaven. Don't preach on sin. God forbid you preach on sin. They're appealing to the sinful desires of the human nature, and they entice people. They're enticing people. A baby, picture this baby Christian. We just had Sarah baptized today. We had Earl baptized last week, Ernesto. Now, they're not babies, per se, but Earl is he's pretty new in his faith. And I'm telling them, listen, this, this Bible is telling you to deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. Serve him. Give yourself a servant. That's not what the, what, what the world teaches. The world teaches something different. Nobody wants to hear that message. But the Christian does. The Christian does. The Christian says, I love the Lord, what he's done for me. I want to do that. I want to do that. I said, well, come to new creation, brother. I'm going to show you how to do that. He says, all right, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I said, come on, brother. I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to help you understand that this life of servanthood is worth it. And this brother is excited. And then Pastor Frank comes along and says, man, don't listen to Pastor Jose. He's so hung up on all this holy living stuff. When we've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, don't listen to him. My way is a heck of a lot easier. And this new Christian's going, easy street or sacrifice? Woe to Pastor Frank. Because that's heresy. What Pastor Frank would be doing in that scenario is appealing to the sinful desires, enticing this new believer to do what's easier and much more convenient. And the Bible says that sin is fun. It's fun for a season till it's time to pay the piper. So I'm appealing to this guy, look, don't you want to, you know, don't you want to have fun? And this guy's like, yeah, it ain't all like Pastor Jose says, you know, you don't got to, I mean, die to yourself. Now, that's pretty radical, wouldn't you say? He works midnight. He's half asleep on Sunday. Listen. <laughs> Pastor Frank starts leading people astray because he's teaching what we call easy believism. Yeah. Nothing new under the sun. Still goes on today. They entice people who were just escaping what? From the, those who lived in error. Those, those young bucks in the, in the faith, those new believers who just come to know Jesus Christ, he, they're enticing them to walk back down the path they just came from. And you know what? They don't know any better. The Bible says, woe to you. 19. They promise them freedom, and they themselves are slaves to depravity. The, the teacher, the teacher who's telling them, hey, look, man, we can go out and fornicate. You can go ahead and commit adultery. It's no big deal. It's all good. Because that's what they're doing. The promise them freedom. The freedom to do whatever they want, including sexual morality. And they themselves, the teacher who's teaching and promising the freedom, are slaves to depravity. They're slaves. They're slaves to their own sin. For a man is a slave to whatever he, whatever has mastered him. Genesis 4, 7. James, could you pull that up real quick? Pretty sure that's the verse. Yes. Genesis 4, 7 is talking, this is where Cain and Abel. What happens is... Uh, the Lord speaking to uh, Cain. He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Yeah. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Right. If you don't follow my ways, God says, I'm telling you the way to walk. If you don't want to follow my ways, God says, disaster is waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Waiting for you. Crouching at your door. God is telling you, use the side door, Frank. Use the side door. Don't use the front door. And your hard-headed, stubborn, and prideful say, well, I'm going to use the front door. I've been using it all my life. Who's got to tell me what I should do? And you step out the front door, and then you get mugged by the sinful whatever that's waiting for you because you chose to be disobedient. The Bible says, he says, if you do what is right, you walk in my ways. What I tell you is right. If you do what I say, you will, not, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is wrong, if you don't do what's right, Sin's crouching at your door. But look what the, next, the last part of that verse says. It's desires to have you. Sin wants you. I heard a saying that said, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you're willing to pay. Sin wants you, and it wants you. Now, what's standing outside your door is different than what's standing outside somebody else's door because it knows what you are susceptible to. Satan is going to entice the drinker with alcohol. 
Satan is going to entice the liar with lies, the opportunity to lie. Satan is going to entice the adulterer with opportunities to commit so, uh, sexual immorality. Satan is going to entice the violent person to be violent. Satan is going to entice the person who steals to steal. The person who doesn't struggle with stealing is not going to be enticed by that. The Bible says you're led away by your own evil desires that are inside your heart, and Satan knows that. And God is telling you, don't go out the front door, because whatever that vice is, whatever it is you're struggling with, is waiting for you there. And you step out anyway, and it grabs hold of you. And it beats you from pillar to post. And you're like, why? Well, it's because your hard headed, stubborn, and, dis uh, and, and disobedient. Mm -hmm. It's going to master you. You have to master it. Go back to uh, 2 Peter, James. We toy with sin, like the cartoon I explained to you about Spike and Tom. We play games. Go back in 2 Peter, James. Verse 19. They promise freedom. They themselves are slaves to depravity, for a man is a slave to whatever masters him. Verse 20. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Go to the next verse. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on it. Sacred command that was passed on to them. It's a big deal. Go back, to, go back one verse. Read it again. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, you're stuck back in this depraved way. They are worse off at the end than they were in the beginning. Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. How many of you have seen the Titanic, the movie? All right. I'm going to ruin it for you if you didn't see it. All right, uh, the ship sunk, <laughs> and when it sunk, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet, I forget their name, it was Jake and Jack and, Jack and Rose. whatever, Rose, thank you, were on this board, this piece of wood that's in the middle of the ocean, and Jack, being a gentleman, puts her up there, gets her up there, and he tries to climb up there too, but it, it's not going to hold them both. He's holding on. I'm watching this movie, I'm watching this movie. It's 20 years ago. I'm watching this movie, and I'm like, he lets go. Yeah. I'm like, hello, McFly. <laughs> I'm going to die of hypothermia before I let go. And I don't know if that's what the movie's trying to tell you. He died of hypothermia, but he looked like he let go on purpose because he didn't want to flip, but she wasn't going to flip. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? You're holding on to the one thing that you have that can possibly save your life, and you're going to let it go? Are you nuts? I ain't letting go of that thing. Now, granted, it couldn't hold them both. That's not what I'm talking about. He's holding on. Oh, remember me, Rose? I always remember you, Jack. And he lets it go. Ooh, and I'm like, no. No. It's a great love story. My point is this. Why on earth would you let go of the very thing, the only thing, that can save you? They had, he had no life jacket, and if he did, he would have froze anyway. At least he would have stayed up and not drowned. If he had a life jacket, if he had a life raft, he had neither. He's holding on to a board that kept him buoyant, kept his head above the water, and he let it go. I'm like, Jack, I, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I would have never done that. What's my point? This is my point. They've escaped from the corruption of the world. Jack escaped drowning in that water by holding on to something that could hold him up. That something for the Christian is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord saves you from the muck and mire, saves you from this sea of sin. Why on earth would you let go of that and go back and sink into the muck and mire? Why would you do that? And as you're sinking and drowning, halfway down, you're thinking, oh, that was a bad idea. Duh! <laughs> but it's too late. Mm -hmm. You see the spiritual implication? Peter's saying that these guys 
They have been, they've escaped the corruption of the world by knowing Jesus Christ, being enlightened, coming out of darkness and into this marvelous light. And now that they're here, they're going to step over here and turn their backs on the way so that they can profit and they can live like kings here on earth or whatever the reason is. It's ridiculous to, give, to, get, to throw away your eternity to gamble on that. Why on earth would you do that? I don't know what the heck Jack Dawson was thinking. And I don't know what the heck the average Christian is thinking who walks away from the Lord. Why on earth would you do that? The only thing that can save you. It's like a person who's sinking in quicksand and you throw them a rope and you, they got it all, oh, pull me out, pull me out. And you say, all right, and you start to pull them out and then they let it go. And you're like, why would you let the rope go? I don't know. They don't have any, maybe it's too hard or whatever the reason is. I like the Jack Dawson illustration better. But to overcome, they're worse off. Those, uh, they, they have, knowing the Lord Jesus, uh, Savior Jesus Christ, and are entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. God helped these people. They're rejecting the very grace of God, the only thing that could save them in the first place. And the next verse said, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. You know what? The Bible it teaches uh, implicitly is that there's degrees of punishment. It would have been better off for them not to have known the way of righteousness. What does that mean? That means they're going to perish. They're going to burn in hell. When you, uh, when you die and are separated from God Almighty, you're going to spend eternity away from God. Amen? Yeah. That's a basic doctrine, church family. Is, 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 is that an Amen. If you die apart from Jesus Christ, apart from the righteousness of Christ, apart from Jesus' forgiveness, you're going to spend eternity separated from God. Amen. So if it would have been better for you to die in that state, not knowing the Lord, than to know the Lord and walk away from him. What does that mean? Sounds like a different degree of punishment. You remember the beamer seat of Christ? I told you when we stand before the Lord, the, the unsaved will stand at the great white throne of judgment and the Christian's going to stand here, the one who's going to be rewarded here, and the other one's going to be standing here like we do in the Olympics with the gold, bronze, and the silver. Remember that? I've demonstrated that for you. The Bible's implying that there's degrees of punishment here. You'd have been better off not to have known the way of righteousness than to know it and blow it. What's wrong with you? Next verse, 22. He's still talking about these teachers. Of them, the proverb is true. He's talking about these teachers. This proverb is true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a soul that is washed goes back to wallowing in the mud. I've heard a person once say, it's like putting a silk hat on a pig or putting a lipstick on a pig. You've heard that terminology before. You can dress up a pig real nice and pretty, clean them up, put some perfume on it, put a nice little suit on a pig, and you're going right back to the mud. This passage is teaching that these folks, this, that this proverb is true of them. They've returned to the muck and mire that they were clean from. Say from. I'm going to end with this story. I've shared it before. I'll share it again. When I was a kid, I went, uh, I went camping with my, father, my godfather. I was little. I was probably 10 years old. I don't know what the heck I was thinking. I couldn't swim, but I thought I was going to go off a diving board. It's a regular diving board, not a high dive. Everybody else was doing it. I don't know what I was thinking. Honest to God, I don't know what I was thinking. I go off this here diving board, and there's this kid behind me waiting for his turn. As I splash into the water, I start to drown. So I, can't, I realize, oh, wow, I can't touch the bottom. I wasn't too sharp. So I'm splashing, trying to get out. I'm trying to dog pad, and I'm freaking out. I had a cousin who was visiting from Cleveland, and she swam out to me to help me. Let me use your hair since I'm not going to mess it up. She swims out to me to help me. And I put my hand on top of her head like this, and I, and I push her down to catch my breath. And, and I, I distinctly remember this. I'm, I got her head down. I'm like, ooh, ooh. I'm like, thank God. Oh, man, I thought I was going to die. And then I looked at her and realized her head was underwater, and her hands were doing this. I'm like, oh, and I realized I was almost going to kill my cousin. I let her head go, and bloop, bloop, bloop. She swam away. She got away. She could swim. I couldn't. So I'm screaming, help, help. And my sister, she swims out to me. And halfway to me, I'm splashing, I'm kicking, and I'm screaming. She's like, man, ain't no sense in both of us dying. She turned around and swam back. <laughs> she was worried about me drowning her. And I get it because she just saw what I did to my cousin. 
I un- I'm not unintentionally. I'm trying to save my own skin here. And I remember those two young ladies, my sister and my cousin, swimming away from me. I remember feeling helpless as I'm trying to scream for help and I'm swallowing water. And I begin to sink into the water. And I remember looking at the lifeguard, another female who wasn't paying attention. She was a teenage girl and she had her attention. Some dude had her attention. They were talking. As I sink into the water, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to die. I was probably 10. And I'm sinking, and it's, it's just nothing you can do. You can't swim. You can't walk out the water. You can't fly out. You're a dead duck. You need a savior. Someone has to save you. And the lifeguard, she would represent good works. My sister would represent family. You know, thinking you're going to get into heaven on the coattails of your mom or your dad. My cousin, you fill in the blank. Good deeds, charity, you know, donation, giving money away. None of that saved me from drowning. My faith was in that lifeguard who didn't come. I thought I was going to die. I hear this big old splash. I don't hear it, but I see it as the boy behind me on the diving board got tired of waiting for me to come out out of the water and get out of his way. And he swims down to me. And he grabs me. I'm holding my breath, and I just can't hold it anymore. He grabs hold of me, and I wrap my legs around his waist. We're chest to chest, and I'm holding on to him as he swims to the top. It's probably twice my weight, which ain't saying much. I was probably like 30 pounds. (laughs) And he swims to the top. As soon as we break the surface of the water, I come up. <gasps> and he puts me on the side. I'm like, <coughs> coughing up water on the side. I'm, I, before he put me down, I was kissing him, hugging on him. And he's like peeling me off like a banana. And he puts me on the side, and I'm coughing, I'm hacking, I'm crying. The lifeguard looks at me and goes, you were serious? I thought you was playing. I said, lady, I was seriously dead if it wasn't for this kid. That boy represents Jesus Christ who dove into the sea of my own sin that I was drowning in and I was going to die in. And he pulled me out of it. You think I went back in that pool that day? I was done. Why on earth would I go back in there and test Temp fate. This kid could have, I was kissing him, I was hugging him, I was so grateful. He could have said, give me $100, I would have gave it to him. He could have said, be my slave for the next month, and I would have done it. Whatever he wanted, I was so grateful that he saved my life. On a spiritual level, Jesus Christ has dove into you, the, the sea of your sin and rescued you from it. And what is a reasonable response to that? The Bible says to present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your reasonable act of service. That's the reasonable thing for you to do for him saving your skin from eternal damnation. Not get back in the pool, which is what exactly a lot of Christians do. Don't be the dog that returns to your own vomit. I want to challenge you to watch. I mean, because you're just like us. I told you, God knows those teachers, and God is going to deal with them but you don't be led astray by them. I told you, we are ultimately victorious. Satan loses the war, but he's winning battles all day, every day, because the average Christian does not take the time to study, to show that self-approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We believe any little heresy that comes our way, any little doctrine that comes our way, we believe it and we run with it. God forbid that that's you. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're not a student of the word of God, I want to encourage you to dig in and study it so that you'd not be led astray because these guys, they still exist. I'm telling you, they do. In our response time, as the music plays, I want to encourage you to search your heart. Ask the spirit of God to search your heart as the music plays. And you ask yourself, do I know enough doctrine? Do I know enough to not be led astray? I want you to ask yourself that. As the music plays, you ask the Spirit of God to to lay on your heart. 
what it is that you need to know and understand about the scripture. I want to I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to make a, a commitment. Remember, infiltration. I drew a picture for you. I even laid down on the altar to show you infiltration. The enemy is infiltrating churches to take them down. And we are giving him the rope to hang us with. Wake up, Christian. Wake up.